happened in this way. So I'm start. I'm I'm just sharing some thoughts uh, uh, about the conference. So like uh, somehow, uh, be it directly or indirectly, the reason that we plan to rethink humanities in a web platform today is linked with three keywords: crisis, change, and existence. However. None of these concerns in relation to a re-evaluation of the idea of humanities is immediately new, but the recurrence of these concerns always constitute an immediacy of or re-examination of epistemological uh, uh, efficacies with respect to a teleological conceptualization of time and existence. While we are facing uh, uh, a similar crisis, uh, uh, a similar uh, urgency, a similar uh, 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 immediacy to think of alternatives, rethink the idea of humanities in new ways. In this conference, we try to examine some of those concerns. The first section, the two keynotes try to talk about this immediate now. Nigel, Professor Nigel will talk about uh, uh, some of the contingencies of going digital, like as we are going digital because of the present situation. What are the different aspects, different uh, 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 things to concern, the different concerns that bring this uh, a going digitization or the going digital of humanities? Whereas Professor Aki's talk is about uh, what comes after COVID, the idea of mm. humanities. And so both the talks are somehow directly or indirectly linked with the urgency of now. Whereas, as as I was, I was supposed to say a few words, which I, I I cannot I I cannot afford to speak now because it's already too late. So this urgency again is not the only urgency because if we talk of World War during the World Wars, as uh, uh, David Ayers and others have pointed out, a similar urgency was constituted to rethink the idea of humanities in relation to ethical and humanitarian concerns. And in the same way, we have seen different turns coming. The, if you say the cultural studies turn, or in the contemporary times, the post-human and the new materialist term. So as if we are also facing a similar crossroad, as if we are facing a similar uh, 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 urgency of a turning that is happening now. But what we decide to call it, that is a contingent area. And in this entire conference, our plan is to discuss such entanglements, not only of the here and now, the urgency of now, the COVID situation, the crisis in humanities, digital, going digital. We are already facing a lot of problems about going digital. So the different concerns of digital, as well as some historical concerns, some links with the here and now. So the first section talks about this. In the next section, we move about aesthetics, questions of aesthetic and decolonization. And then we move towards post-coloniality, comparative literature, and diaspora studies. So this is how we plan in these three days to discuss some of the different layers in which the rethinking of humanities calls for an urgent rethinking in this uh, uh, time, in this present time. So without uh, uh, going any forward, I would introduce Professor Nigel Wood, our first speaker today, uh, to mention just a few words about Professor Nigel Wood. Professor Nigel Wood is a professor of literature and head of the School of Humanities at Lobro University. His specialist areas of research are 18th century literature and the staging of dramatic texts, especially Shakespeare and contemporary work. In addition, he is particularly interested in the application of literary and cultural theories to literary and non-literary writing. His edition of She Stoops to Conquer and other 18th century comedies for Oxford University Press was published in May 2007. He is also co-editing the first two volumes of Longman Annotated Poets, Alexander Pope, dealing with the early poems, translations, and imitations, and for Paul Grave, a fully edited and annotated source book of literary and cultural historical documents covering the years 1632 to 1780s. Some of his renowned publications are not only include uh, volumes and uh, uh, contributions in canonical uh, uh, works like the Prelude, Mansfield Park, Don Juan, Westland, A Passage to India, and others. He, is, he also works as an occasional advisory for the National Theatre and the Royal Shakespeare Company, as well as lectures at the Shakespeare Institute and Shakespeare Birthplace Trust in Stratford, 
upon uh, upon Avon and Shakespeare's Blow. He is also edited the Longman Critical Editor Reader volume of Swift. Among his other uh, uh, notable uh, contributions, a volume of essay on John Gay and an edition on the selected diaries and journals of Francis Burney is also noteworthy. I call Professor uh, Nigel Wood to uh, uh, deliver his uh, uh, keynote today uh, uh, and I, I, I transfer uh, it to Nigel Wood now. Nigel, yeah. Thank you very much, Subro, and thanks very much for organizing the conference. I'm surprised there aren't more technical problems than have become apparent. Um, uh, several preparatory things I want to say. Firstly, thanks for understanding me in English. I cannot speak anything else. Um, and I'm Western trained. Um, <clears throat> so my comments are going to reflect, obviously, on my experience, but they're as not as holistic as I would like them to be. Um, I've been thinking a lot and been forced to rethink, given Subro and Amity's invitation, uh, not only about you know, the present uh, crisis, but about how humanities has evolved in any case. And it's not unusual for the humanities to revision th themselves uh, due to external stimuli. It isn't as if there's been a steady, how can I put it, a steady evolution which has been self-determining with the humanities. It is always to a degree reacted and reacted creatively as I expect we will now. I also would very much like there to be further association between my own institution and the institutions represented at this conference, so that as with all the best conferences, this is the start of something uh, and not simply a conclusion. Now, I hope you have on your screens my PowerPoint, um, and my title is Travelling Towards the Post-Human. I've, first of all, I think it's probably best to start with some definitions. Um, and I think that there is a definition of uh, digital that I think will be useful. It's the use of computational means to address research questions. And this has opened up uh, an access to empirical data which questions traditional assumptions about declared intentions and conscious motivation. Certainly that is the positive virtue of digital inquiry. So in order to understand that, we have to relinquish an element of human preconception because some of our uh, ideas, some of our first principles do not necessarily always fit where the data leads us. And its opposite is analog, which is a reliance on memory and other human modes of inquiry that judges the fitness of the conclusions with reference to the culture of the individual and the well-being of a collective, etc. It also relies on the usefulness and advisability of an education in a canon of taste, which of course is varied, but it is relatively fixed. Now, having said that there is a virtue in the digital, it is inescapable that it changes the way that we actually read. This is not simply my idea, but it's the idea about what the habit of reading might consist of. And you might think of all the other factors and possibilities and alternatives that impinge upon the solitary person reading in a linear fashion from beginning to through the middle to the end. And here, the kinds of reading I'm talking about are purposive, functional, goal-centered, which is linear, with a different kind of reading, which is radial, which is detailed, but lateral and recursive. In other words, we don't necessarily have an attention span of an 18th century reader or a reader in, shall we say, other parts of the world. And it would be difficult to generalize <clears throat> on the strength of that. 
So we have to think about how we actually read. In other words, what shapes in the head are created by our reading. And the person who, the textual editor and textual theorist, who best exemplifies what is meant by radial reading is Jerome McGann, the editor of Byron's works in his textual condition, which is quite old now, but at its time introduced an element which has caused much comment since. And I'll quote, radial reading involves decoding one or more of the contexts that interpenetrate the scripted and physical text. The person who temporarily stops reading to look up the meaning of a word is properly an emblem of radial reading because the kind of radial operation is repeatedly taking place even while one remains absorbed with a text. So the actuality of reading is a decoding exercise, is um, a, a freely chosen moment of reflection. One has it manipulated by the author because there is uh, there are chapters in a novel, there are acts in a play, there are stanzas even in a poem, but that isn't accurately going to operate upon us as to how we actually read. And where digital theorists come in is to estimate, and here is a quotation from Edward Moretti in his distant reading, who was the ex-leader of the Stanford Literary Lab, where he establishes an idea of distant reading. We can now look at a whole mass of published work at a glance and with an ease of access that was undreamt of even seven or eight years ago. We can see features because we have a meta view that others before, no matter how uh, well read and how intelligent they were, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants, if you like, that we cannot uh, and we cannot assess. So there has been, and the digital theorists would like to think there has been, an epistemological break with the past. One of many, may I say, in the history of humanities. One of my um, one of my favorite digital theorists is Catherine Hales. And I would certainly wish to preach uh, something of her understanding because I think it's foundational in how we look at the digital and indeed the postmodern. She calls this operation that I've just described machine reading. And she's aware of the fact that it has unsettling implications because it points towards a post-human mode of scholarship in which human interpretation takes a backseat to algorithmic processes. Of course, there are limits to this and some human intervention, and Hales makes much of this later in the book I'm quoting from. We're in charge of the questions that we ask for the data. So in other words, those algorithmic processes are set in train by questions that we'd like to pose in the first place. However, we are not in control and we lose control on a much earlier stage in the process of where the algorithms may lead us. I do remember going on YouTube and I uh, selected a podcast which turned out to be in terms of politics exactly what was contrary to my own political persuasion. Only a matter of half an hour later, in my favourite column, there came a load of similar political podcasts that I didn't want and didn't wish to view. But the machine had thought that I was interested in certain forms of right-wing white supremacist ideologies and had thought that something called congenial for me could be provided. I, of course, chose not to enter 
those spaces. And I think that's important. You, we can stand in front of the machine. However, it's undeniable, I think, that our older definitions of what humanity might be are undergoing some kind of challenge, if not changed. Is the human, do we see ourselves as volitional? Do we see ourselves as a fixed point of reference? And this is all the more disquieting because the technological opportunities are very rapidly outrunning the capacity for our ability to frame research questions and therefore for us to have a secure mastery of the means by which we come to conclusions. Now, I look back at in the recent history of uh, culture and cultural theory for where something particularly outrageous has been announced but which i think has now come back through the back door to be of relevance as we now are jean baudrillard scandalized everyone by reflecting upon the iraq war the first one as one that was really conducted, as far as we are concerned, by image rather than reality. Its existence, its actual resonance for us, was conditioned more by the means than the actual explosion of bombs or carpet bombing that occurred in real time there. And I'll just, I won't read the whole of it, but I will summarize it. When the real is no longer what it used to be, nostalgia assumes its full meaning. There is a proliferation of myths of origin and signs of reality. The book we have in our hand, for example, rather than an electronic version of it, of second hand truth, objectivity and authenticity. Baudrillard later goes on to say that are we more likely to believe the truth of a book that we actually in hard copy can hold rather than an electronic impulse which is derived from it or indeed increasingly is the origin of the book that we have. There is an escalation of the true of the lived experience, a resurrection of the figurative where the object and substance have disappeared and there is a panic stricken production of the real and the referential above and parallel to the panic of material production. This is how simulation appears in the phase that concerns us, a strategy of the real, neo-real and hyper-real, whose universal double is a strategy of deterrence. My own granddaughter spends on average two and a half, between two and a half and three hours of her life every day seeing the world through a screen. I may argue with her that this uh, is not the most profitable way to live her life. She ought to lift her eyes from the page, electronic page, and look outside herself. And yet she finds the screen existence she has access to more natural and more instinctive as a maneuver than going outside and wandering in the countryside. I mean, I don't think, I think this may be a phase, I hope, it's a phase she's going through, but I fear that for many it will not be. Now, if we are, I'm going to take a detour and talk about humanism. Because the centrality of the human had a radical edge. And as Subra has pointed out, I've been trying to estimate the real impact in the early modern era in England and increasingly in the continent of humanistic thought. The interest in the individual, the interest in subjectivity as being a privileged access to the real and the authentic. And I could have quoted many instances of where humanism erupted and destroyed previous very uh, lively predestined habits of thought. You've got to realize that the cornerstone of the Protestant religion in England 
which was fairly fledgling, was based on 39 articles of faith that everybody was expected to sign up to. And by rote, certain of these articles were read out every Sunday, a day of observance for the Christians. And this is the one on predestination and election. Predestination to life is the everlasting purpose of God, whereby before the foundations of the world were laid, he hath constantly decreed by his counsel secret to us to deliver from curse and damnation those whom he hath chosen in Christ out of mankind and to bring them by Christ to everlasting salvation as vessels made to honour. Wherefore, they which be endued with so excellent a benefit of God be called according to God's purpose by his spirit working in due season. They through grace obey the calling. They be justified freely. They be made sons of God by adoption. They be made like the image of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. They walk religiously in good works and at length. By God's mercy, they attain everlasting felicity. Now, where does Hamlet or where do some of the published as opposed to a manuscript poetry of this time? Where does this fit? There is a tragedy, an innate tragedy, in that if you were a spectator at a Shakespeare play, you would know that you lived in ignorance. You know that you were fallen, that you were born out of sin. And you didn't know, but God did, what the narrative into which you figured might turn out to be. The important phrase to me in this is that this is counsel's secret to us. Hamlet doesn't know, although he rather thinks by Act 5 that he will be damned. Throughout most of it, his doubt about the sin of his stepfather is just not known. His doubt about the veracity of what the ghost tells him is not known. As E. M. Forster in the Marabar Caves has quite quizzically said, the echo through a lot of our urgent questions is Uboom. So I return and I return to a Catherine Hale's comment right at the start of her writing in 1999 on the digital. We are confronted, I think, with the same urgency of thinking about what human choice might be and how operative it could be. If you're an American voter at this moment, I would suggest that this is a very urgent matter. What is fake news? On what might I base my individual judgment when I cast my vote? Unfortunately, in Britain, we're a long way away from moments of decision when our ontology about ourselves in a democratic process can be put to the test. But this is how Catherine Hales in 1999, remember, thinks about the voyage towards the post-human. The very illusion of control bespeaks a fundamental ignorance about the nature of the emergent processes through which consciousness, the organism and the environment are constituted. Mastery through the exercise of autonomous will is merely the story consciousness tells itself to explain results that actually come about through chaotic dynamics and emergent structures. There is a clash here, isn't there, between believing that we can characterize the present and the contemporary by a sort of reliance on some overall and overarching zeitgeist. And yet, of course, if we live in the present and the contemporary, and this must be true of uh, a Renaissance or early modern English man or woman at a play, or uh, an early reader in the 18th century of novels, 
that we cannot characterize our own present because we are in it. To us, it may appear chance and chaotic. You think of the experiments in stream of consciousness that you'd find in Virginia Woolf and James Joyce, especially in Ulysses, that inability to be able to find a confidence in the human controlling vision. Is that where we now are? Well, it's a crisis of cognition, I would say. And our ability to know has only been accentuated because we have so much access. The sight of fake news is because we are very frequently not taking account of everything that is available to us via the web. I should read, of course, all the many organs of news in order to try and find some overarching and synoptic view of what is happening in the world, but I don't. I choose to read the newspapers or the sites on the net that most conduce to where I start from in my preconceptions of where I think ethically and politically, I ought to situate myself. I inhabit, therefore, and create for myself, as James Lawley and Penny Tompkins point out, my own metaphor landscape. A metaphor landscape has to have a form before it can transform. Once a client has entered the symbolic domain, the more they attend to and engage with the symbols in their perceptual space, the more they establish the foundations of a metaphor landscape within which patterns can emerge and the more they create a context in which the conditions for transformation can arise. During the process, the client discovers they can have a special relationship with certain resource symbols, which can have a beneficial effect on other symbols. This is my way of suggesting that an interrogation of language and evidence and philosophy of the human, which is the domain of the humanities, can actually be taken to predate any asking of questions, or indeed the most forensic interrogation and harvesting of data, and why it is absolutely essential that we maintain it in whatever definition we may find it, or nuance we may find it. For it is the stories we tell ourselves, the metaphor landscapes that we hope we can freely establish for ourselves, rather than have visited upon us through nationalist myths and myths also of race and gender and class, that we can be truly free. So to sum up, I often tell my final year dissertation students that there should be elements of the following. There should be a description of the field. There should be analysis. But, and this is where they are less able and they need to be reminded, they should come to judgment. And this is where the human, I think, is important. The facts or the data do not speak for themselves. They cannot. They're brought into our domain, a metaphor landscape, if you like, because we've asked the questions or we've felt the need for answers to such questions ourselves. And to be able to complete that circle, we must be able to judge freely and without reliance too much on preconception of what we find. I'll skip about Empson's complex words because that is about the difficulties of using language itself. But I'll end with Moretti's view about his experience of reading the play Hamlet, and then I'll finish with a couple of reflections, which I hope might provoke discussion. What Moretti did was do a word or phrase frequency program and ran 
it through the folio version, not the only version of Hamlet, I'm aware. And he realized that there was a, a flow whereby certain words became accentuated and in an oral performance would have been an emphasis that sometimes we lose if we really read, we only read Hamlet in our studies. This is what he says about the revelation of trying to be digital about Hamlet might amount to. Though Horatio is an old fixation of mine, I had never fully understood his role in Hamlet until I looked at the play's network structure. The key word here is looked. What I took from network theory was its basic form of visualization, the idea that the temporal flow of a dramatic plot can be turned into a set of two dimensional signs, vertices or nodes and edges, and grasped at a single glance. Now, I think this is exciting, but I think it is also limiting. Because we develop, we develop through conversation, we develop through collisions, we develop through knowing more. Otherwise, we simply return to the number we first thought of. And if there is an urgency about defining the human, it is that we are flexible and we can react in different ways under a banner of the human itself. The second thing is, we're not going to get to the bottom of what is happening within humanities without coming to an understanding of what is really happening to the very basis of cognition. Our reading habits, our access to ideas outside ourselves, but fundamentally at the end of the day, whether uh, an answer to the question as to whether we are open, truly open, as those early humanists were, to the outside, to the other, and that is a far harder thing to accomplish than to describe uh, in 30 minutes. Thank you. Has any uh, question uh, uh, or any uh, thing to add on Professor Nigel's uh, talk? Uh, they can ask uh, anyone from the uh, uh, question. Uh, you can write your questions in the uh, chat box. If anyone has any question. OK, uh, Professor Rotan Mohanta has a question. I'm, I'm asking that. Nigel, is it, is it audible? Yes, it is. Yes. Yeah. Language itself being a symbolic system has helped humans to understand the world as a symbolic order. Has the new symbolic order inaugurated by the digitally super, superseded language? The visual has now dominated our cognition what are your views on this just a moment that's a I'm very good point yeah, yeah it's a very good point um okay i i think we're talking about degree i think the degree to which the visual governs our reliance and our understanding on language of language is um is quite clear um, I, I refer you to somebody I've just read, which is a book called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. And it came out in 2011. He's, econo he's an, an economist. And he said that in terms of cognition, there are two kinds, predominant kinds of cognition. There are those that are fast, like when you see an image of a train or a car speeding towards us or in real life and the decisions you make have to be fast and they're made without uh, a sense of deliberation and then there are the decisions about our life which are slow have to be slow deliberative he calls them like solving a mathematical problem uh, sifting alternative forms of evidence for a research report where it is a virtue to be deliberative and to be slow about our responses. The ease and the facility by which we can gather information, 
is almost a point at which, you know, the means outweigh the ends. And the trouble is, a lot of what we counted upon as being deliberative, consciously weighed and perhaps reasonable responses have been overtaken by the need for those responses to be first. And the visual stimuli are the ones that are more instantaneous and more effectual in altering the way that we see the world, the angle by which we see the world, but also as part of that process of making decisions. And what Kahneman says is that this has sometimes very skewed and altered effects on economic forecasting because it's so much easier to believe in the first principles you started your investigation in and regard everything that didn't quite fit as unfortunate exceptions to the rule you had instigated for yourself. And that is where being human, truly human, not being a surrender to the machine, but also not being a surrender to an ideology or being unduly wedded to the number and the ideas you first thought of becomes operative. So I th I'm glad for that question, but I think it's an important one. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we have uh, another question also. Uh, this is by uh, Gargi Ghoshal. Uh, the question is, as we see a blurring of the boundaries between the Deleuzian concepts of real and virtual in the present times, what does actual correspond to according to you? I think at the end of the day, the old fashioned sense of value. Um, I, I think that what Deleuze is getting at is the fact that there are unwelcome aspects of obviously ideology, um, unshunable aspects of ideology, which do form us. But it's up to us to win for ourselves a space for deliberation or deliberative thought in some ways. Now, when I've announced this at certain theoretical conferences, this has met with some opposition and I completely understand it because I seem to be resorting to a kind of liberal answer where the human is king and that um, rational processes have to take second place to it. I don't think that's the case. I think that, how can I put this? Theory is heuristic. It's a means to an end to valuable knowledge uh, and valuable action. And action is important, just like in the student's dissertations, judgment is important. You can never be at a position where the data is all in and is exhaustively gathered. But then we would never do anything. And it's really in a way to recover agency. To recover a sense of moving forward. And parading in the streets. Even though we don't know all of the counter arguments that might give us pause. I think there has to be a more pragmatic sense of operating where the human isn't just an inert concept, but is one that underpins activism of some kind. And I think that this departs from what I'm, I taught it on many occasions, the more and more conservative aspects of deconstruction removes language of its effectiveness and relegates activism as being a matter of textual persuasion alone. There has to be some value system which is in place which is the basis on which those first questions are asked. And that's the, that's the circularity of the difficulty about humanities. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, because, uh, because we have uh, already 
reached uh, uh, we're running late so we cannot take all the questions so we can take only one more question if uh, you allow Naji. so this last question i'm taking this is from Navanita karanjay and this is about embodiment so he's uh, she's asking that do you think mm -hmm. subjectivity in the digital age is both algorithmic and embodied as it is a combination of the algorithm and the subject's embodiment within his or her own geographical, economic, or cultural milieu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that, okay, when I do work with the Royal Shakespeare Company or with the National Theatre, if I start there, an actor, and to some extent, the spectators that form the audience that have to meet there, want a realization which is another way of saying an embodiment as a result as an effect of any rehearsal process do you follow me the end result <clears throat> is to force the body with the scenic design in physical real time to have an effect Now, it does seem to me that these two currents run counter to each other. Reliance on the screen. But of course, what Moretti is saying in distant reading is that it's essential to consider digital modes of access. Not that digital modes of access are instead of all of the emotiveness that comes from reading sensitively and holistically a particular work or seeing it on stage or supporting a Black Lives Matter protest. Right? It is often taken to be and I do not think it needs to be. If we look at the digital as being an important heuristic step, it doesn't mean that the end usurps the means. It means that it helps us better to the means that we and the action that we take from it, I would hope. Thank you, uh, Nigel, for this uh, uh, talk. Despite all the uh, huge difficulties, oh, super. Can I just say one more yeah. thing? Yeah, yeah, I sure. Just, just a pay. moment. I'm just a moment. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm sending it live. There are some. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's on. Happy to answer questions offline, of course. Very happy. You have my email. I will do my best. But also, I regret I have to leave the conference for about half an hour at 11 o'clock my time uh, because I have to attend a high level meeting about the pandemic crisis, mm. but I will return as quick as I can to the conference. So I'm not leaving it in a sort of negligent way. It's because I have to as head of universities. Um, but anyway, thanks very much for the invitation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel, for this uh, talk. And, and thank you that in the in despite all your heavy schedule, uh, um, I was continuously speaking with Akhidi and Akhidi had a series of meetings and uh, uh, evaluation and everything. And like, thankfully, we are finally able to host this. And while we are going digital, uh, uh, Nigel has talked about uh, some of the aspects that this going digital or and the, and, the, and the concerns of digital might come out. Yes, questions of embodiment, questions of limitations, limitations of accessibility, development. There's certain infrastructural questions also come always, which again in certain context highlight the question of accessibility. That can everyone access uh, uh, the digital move? Can everyone really go digital irrespective of uh, 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 any differentiation, any dis 